7.30 p.m. on Thursday, May 7, 2020. Thank you for joining us today. This is Janet Hill with the Rock Island County Health Department. Today we'll, we will be hearing from Nina Ludwig at the Rock Island County Health Department and Ed Rivers at the Scott County Health Department. We are also joined by representatives from the Quad City Interfaith to discuss faith in the time of isolation. All speakers will have prepared statements. Um, we also, again, will have an um, American Sign Language interpreter uh, to be included in our briefings. Um, to make sure that the sign language interpreter is shown, we ask that you make that you uh, use the gallery view, which is the top right-hand corner of your Zoom screen, and then to make sure that the speaker and the interpreter are both visible. Uh, you might want to hide non-video participants so that your, sc your screen is not too cluttered. Um, and as always, our uh, presenters will ask or answer your questions at the end. Uh, we ask that you type them in the chat box and direct them, direct the question to who you want the answer from. Nita, will you begin with the numbers for Rock Island County? One second, Nita, we don't have your sound. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead. I'm so sorry. So we are reporting one additional death today from COVID-19 in a Rock Island County resident. And we do realize that all the residents who have died have family and friends, and they are loved ones of those family and friends. And we as a community must do our part to protect those whose immune systems are weakened and can't fight off this disease as easily. Please stay home as much as possible. Wear a face covering when you're out and practice social distancing. Please only go out for essential food and supply trips and wash your hands frequently. These are the only tools that we have right now to gain control of this pandemic. Your individual actions do affect the community as a whole. In addition, the health department has 18 new cases of COVID-19 today, bringing our total in Rock Island County to 548 cases. 21 of those individuals are hospitalized. In Scott County today, our number was listed as 274. That's an increase of 14 since we spoke yesterday. Our deaths remain at seven. Uh, the governor announced today that the coronavirus.iowa.gov website has been improved. Uh, there is a lot more information, a lot more representation, the graphical representations uh, of the data that uh, is available there. We'll continue to report our daily calendar, our deaths, but for all other uh, information, we suggest you go to the coronavirus.iowa.gov website. Also, since we last spoke with you, Governor Reynolds announced additional reopenings, some of which include Scott County. Tomorrow, dental offices can resume dental services if they follow the stated guidelines and uh, needed personal protective equipment guidelines. Also tomorrow, the following facilities can open as long as they ensure social distancing and hygiene practices, campgrounds, drive-in movie theaters, tanning facilities, medical spas, fitness centers under limited circumstances of one patron at a time, malls at limited capacity, and other retail establishments. And although some facilities in our community will be allowed to open in the next few days, COVID-19 illness continues to circulate in our community. This means that uh, how we respond to the reopenings in our community will be an important factor in how well our community can further contain the spread of the virus and protect the most vulnerable in our community. Before running out to the nearest retail outlet or other business, ask yourself the following questions to ensure that you're doing your best to protect yourself and others. Do I have any symptoms that suggest I'm ill? If yes, please stay home. Do I have an underlying health condition that makes me more at risk should I come into contact with someone who has the virus? If so, Consider well before being around others. Is this a necessary trip for myself or my family? If not, be sure you want to go. How can I make sure 
Could I keep physical distance between myself and others while I'm in a public space? Choosing to go at non-peak times are a, a good decision to make. How can I ensure hand hygiene while I'm out? Carrying hand sanitizer is a great option. Iowa is reopening, but COVID has not left the state. Act accordingly. Thank you. Okay, go ahead, Nita. Sure. Any parent or guardian knows how quickly a baby can go through a pack of diapers. Today at the Rock Island County Health Department, we saw how quickly a community can snatch up 13,000 diapers. The health department provided the parking lot and a little organizational help, and volunteers from two nonprofits provided the labor and the love to serve 201 families and 263 children. Davenport-based Heine Heroes and Galesburg-based uh, Diaper Bank Loving Bottoms plan to come back to our health department for another uh, pickup event in June sometime. We will let you know when, when that is happening. An event will be announced soon for Scott County, but details have not yet been worked out. Families began lining up at 9.15 this morning, even though the event wasn't supposed to start until 10 a.m. Soon the lines stretch from our parking lot onto the avenue around us and up to the corner. So we had quite the lineup this morning. We all must take a moment to remember how devastating this pandemic has been on the families and our economy. But as Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker has said repeatedly, you can't have a livelihood if you don't have a life. When in public, when, I'm sorry, we in public health serve our clients who live check to check frequently. Our staff members regularly see how diapers strain family budgets, even in non-COVID times. No state or federal safety net program allows for, for diapers, allows families to buy diapers with benefits. All diapers can cost up to $80 per month per child. We're working out the details to be a permanent partner with these nonprofit organizations. And our families need the help, and we're grateful for these organizations that are here for them. Heine Heroes offers help to families through the generosity of others. If you wish to donate to the 501c3 organization, visit their website at HeineHeroes.com. That's HeineHeroes.com. And all donations are tax exempt. Okay, thank you, Ed and Nita. We appreciate your information today. Um, next, we will be hearing from some of our Quad Cities Interfaith partners. Um, so we'll be introducing Rabbi Linda Burtonsall from Temple Emmanuel, Reverend Rich Hendricks from Metropolitan Community Church Quad Cities, and Lisa Killinger, who will be joining us momentarily from the Muslim community of the Quad Cities. Um, so first, we would like to hear from Rabbi Linda uh, Rabbi Linda, please go ahead, and then Rich, we can also have you um, put your camera on as well. But there is an important rabbinic teaching that whoever saves one life is considered to have saved an entire world, while destroying one life is like destroying an entire world. <clears throat> to unnecessarily risk the life of another person by ending our social distancing, our physical distancing, before it is safe, is to risk destroying an entire world. And that is why the Jewish community will be following the guidance of health professionals in deciding when and how to reopen our doors. That time is not now. Jewish tradition has so many teachings for this time of crisis. It teaches personal responsibility to maintain public health. In the Torah and the book of Leviticus, we learned that people who suspected they had the mysterious disease Sara'at got inspected, stayed quarantined in their homes until cleared, and if sure they were infected, actually left the camp masked and shouting out their infected status until it was safe for them to return. Now, when anyone could be infected without symptoms and not know, Responsibility falls to each of us to protect our neighbors with physical distancing and with protective gear when physical proximity is absolutely necessary. 
Judaism teaches responsibility to individuals as well. In the Holiness Code in Leviticus, we're told not only to love our neighbor, but also not to stand idly by as our neighbor bleeds. When someone is in crisis <clears throat> or their health or life is in danger, we have a responsibility directly to that person. The congregation I serve is disproportionately made up of seniors at greater risk from COVID-19. Far be it from me to risk any of their lives by calling the community together too soon. But this commandment also means helping the most physically vulnerable safely get the food and other essentials that they need. And it means that we must look out for all of our essential workers, our healthcare workers and first responders, our meat packers and grocery store workers and mail carriers, everyone who risks their own health and safety to provide us the necessities of life, making sure that they're provided personal protective gear necessary to do their heroic work without needlessly endangering themselves and their families. So in the Jewish community, we'll meet in large groups only virtually and wear protective gear, for example, when we work to provide food to those in need. And we follow the spiritual disciplines of treating each day as a wondrous gift we are charged to put to good use and of being God's partners in redemption. These spiritual disciplines strengthen us to maintain physical distancing for as long as necessary to save an entire world. Thank you so much, Rabbi Linda. Next, we'll hear from Reverend Rich Hendricks with the Metropolitan Community Church Quad Cities. Good afternoon. I speak today as the co-chair of the Faith Leaders Caucus of Quad Cities Interfaith and the co-chair of One Human Family QCA. Clergy and faith leaders of many faith traditions in the Quad Cities stand united in our concern regarding allowing face-to-face -face spiritual and religious gatherings before the danger of new infections and additional deaths has passed. That time is not yet. We believe that faith and science are not in opposition and strongly encourage people to wear masks and to adhere to physical distancing while in public. Each of our faith traditions celebrates life. Our approaches to the divine may differ, but for each of us, God is life giving and life affirming. While there is great spiritual power in sanctuary services, God is not just found within the walls of our houses of worship. God is not just found in religious services. God is available and accessible to us whenever and wherever we seek to connect to the divine. God is calling upon us at this time to look deep within ourselves as we seek new ways of being together of being connected with both God and with one another. It was never intended that gathering for sanctuary worship and prayer be a life-threatening activity. So we should not be doing that at this time. We are blessed to live in a time when faith communities can and do gather safely in virtual worship spaces through the miracle of the internet. For now, it is enough. I hope that our faith leaders will continue to prioritize the safety and well-being of the members of their congregations by keeping their doors, the doors to their houses of worship, shut during this health crisis. One of the most emotionally taxing roles that we have as clergy is officiating at the funerals of our beloved congregants and friends. The fewer deaths from COVID-19, the fewer funerals we will have to perform. To the faithful, make more phone calls, write personal notes, connect to one another by whatever means you can safely do so. Your love is needed now more than ever. To honor those who have already fallen to this heinous coronavirus, we call upon everyone to come outside 
and ring bells or make noise at 3 p.m. tomorrow, Friday, May 8th. After a couple of minutes of noise, please pause and say a prayer to honor those who have already died. Thank you. Thank you both for your messages. It doesn't look like Lisa has been able to join us quite yet. So if she is still able to join us while we're still on the call, we will make sure and um, add her into that. So Nita and Ed, we would encourage you to bring your cameras back on and we can go to the question portion of our call today. Um, again, thank you. So please feel free to type questions into the chat here. Um, we wanna make sure that we have everyone included and make sure to let us know who your questions are for. Um, Nita, would you be able to put your camera back on for us? Yeah, but you took me off my, there I am. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yes, we were trying to limit those on screen so everyone could see. Um, our first question is for you, Nita. Um, Generations in Rock Island has reported seven deaths and 29 confirmed positives. Was wondering if there's any explanation for why it is the highest of all the nursing homes and if the health department is working with Generations. Well, I certainly don't think I can answer why it is a higher number than other nursing homes. I think, you know, with this virus, we're all kind of learning as we go, and we'll probably know the answers to all those things five years from now. Um, however, I would say, yes, we are working very closely with all the long-term care uh, facilities within Rock Island County, and this one in particular. Of course, I know since it is an outbreak status, we our uh, infectious disease nurses have been calling and talking with their leadership, going through the Illinois Department of Public Health guidance and the recommendations from the CDC for taking care of their residents and their uh, employees as well. So yes, we have been working with them. We actually had a state call with the uh, liaison for long-term care from IDPH and our nurses this afternoon as well. Thank you. Our next question is for you as well, Nita. Um, two kids under the age of 15 were reported positive. Please remind us, are those the first teenagers or children? And do you know how many teens and children have tested positive? Um, they have not been the first. Um, I think we've had a couple over the last couple of weeks. I, I couldn't really tell you the dates off the top of my head. But it is affecting people of all ages. And as we have seen, on the news and here locally, it can affect people in various ways. It can be very mild illness to a very severe illness, especially if you have underlying health conditions or chronic health conditions, it can be very serious. So while children seem to be a little bit more resilient, we also have children in our community who have chronic health conditions and this could be very serious for them as well. Thank you, Nita. We had another question about the Scott County number, so we typed that into the chat. 274 total cases for Scott County, which is an increase of 14 from yesterday. Um, the next question, Ed, I believe this may be um, for Scott County, since I believe it's the state of Iowa. Why has the state made the decision not to announce daily numbers, and why not be completely transparent? Um, that is not the case. The uh, state has announced both state and county counts every day and continues to do so on coronavirus.iowa.gov. I would encourage you to go there and uh, look at the data. Um, the next question, I'm not sure if this is for Nita or Ed, so I would start with Nita. If the state public health department has made the information public, would you please tell us about any outbreaks or clusters, including Tyson numbers? Sure, so the Illinois Department of Public Health, as I have uh, stated before, they generally do not identify publicly um, workplaces or businesses or facilities, but they have in this instance with the pandemic, they have identified long-term care facilities with outbreaks and those are on the Illinois Department of Public Health website. Um, and you can search by county for those. And since the meatpacking plants have been an issue across the country, we have gone ahead and shared that the outbreak status there um, at Tyson plant in Joslin. And today's number is 103 Rock Island County residents 
who are confirmed positive COVID at the Tyson plant in Joslin. And again, I would just stress to everyone that not everybody works at Tyson or a nursing home or is in a nursing home, and you really have to be vigilant in everyone you meet, in every trip you make, to make sure you are washing your hands and covering your face and keeping your distance at least six feet apart from others around you. Thank you. I'm just looking through the additional questions here. Um, Ed, do you have anything to add about any um, outbreaks that have been announced in Scott County? Um, as we discussed yesterday, the state of Iowa has announced no outbreaks in Scott County. Uh, the threshold for business outbreaks has been set at 10% of the employees and for uh, long-term care facilities, that number is three illnesses. Uh, so there have been none to announce in Scott County. Thank you. For the next question, um, why do we have to dig for the information? There are daily briefings. Isn't that what daily briefings are for? This does not make it easier for the general public to learn information. I think that was in regards to information from the Iowa Department of Public Health and the governor's office. And we would encourage you to contact both of them. They're the ones who determine the information and the manner it's put on the site. And so they'd be able to answer questions about what data is and isn't available on there. Um, it is their data that is shared through there. Um, I'll give another second for any additional questions. If not, we'll be able to conclude our call for today. Brooke, I think there was something else about Tyson that I could address, if, if that's okay. Oh, sure. Please go ahead, Nita. Thank you. So it is still two deaths that have been related to Tyson from Rock Island County. And again, that number of confirmed positive cases is 103. And I understand that you will likely ask this every day. I understand it is of great concern to everybody here in the county. But again, I would just stress that people in the general public should not get complacent and that they should take those precautions to keep themselves safe every day. Could I add something? Because we've been talking about six feet as, um, as the physical distancing that's required. I want to say that in the worship context, at least for congregations that worship like mine do with a lot of singing, um, singing is a super spreading activity. Um, six feet is not even a safe distance for the worship context. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're really asking people to please not open the doors for worship and put people in danger. Well, thank you. It looks like um, Lisa Killinger with the Muslim Community of the Quad Cities wasn't able to join us. So if she provides us some additional information, we will make sure to share that. Thank you again to the additional participants who joined us today in providing information. And we look forward to talking with everyone again next week. We don't anticipate having a briefing tomorrow. And going forward, we anticipate to host our Zoom press briefings at the same time, but this time three days a week. And um, we've been coming to you five days a week for the past two months. And so we believe now is a good time for us to focus on uh, meeting those needs on Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We'll still be able to communicate the important information as well as the needs. And Thursday. Wednesday, Thursday, excuse me, I think I misspoke there. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And um, we will follow up with that information in our press release that comes out afterwards. But we believe we can meet your needs as well as ours. So again, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to talking with you next week. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us.